not gonna say it, guys. I'm not gonna say it. Nope, that. Mm, not gonna say it. Not gonna say it. Not happening. Listen, Jordan Peele's third feature film is here, and there are a lot of things I could say about it, but I'm not gonna say that, okay? It's not gonna happen. What I will say about Nope is not only is it a magnificent spectacle of the thriller genre, not only is it one of the best films of the year so far, this might genuinely be Jordan Peele's best film to date. It's at least my favorite. That's right, I went there. Gnome came along and told Get Out to... Well, you know, get out. And look, the initial reactions are out there. Some people love this thing. Others, peel devotees even, f***ing hate it. And a lot of reactions are landing in the it's good, but it's not amazing camp. Fair enough. Some of us can be overcome by the sight of a UFO and completely lose our senses. I get it. Happens to the best of us. For those who are lost among us, wandering the hills, let me show you the way. Let me tell you about how masterfully Peel utilizes tension throughout this. About how brilliantly the IMAX ratio is utilized when it really counts on a level that rivals even the great Christopher Nolan. About why Academy Award winner Daniel Kaluuya, for all of the brilliantly subdued work that he's doing, isn't even giving the best or maybe even second best performance in the film because his co-stars are just as excellent. This is a masterful film for that and so many other reasons and why waste any more time? Let's just get into it. Let me tell you why Nope is anything but. Even if I'm not gonna say that about it. Nope is a stylistically adventurous, bold statement from Jordan Peele. Starting with that little non-linear glimpse of the Gordy's home incident, only to then send us, as much as we don't realize it in the moment, into the belly of the beast, looking right into the box-shaped camera view screen like mouth of the alien over the main credits, gradually developing and revealing the image of the horse in motion. The first movie star, one whose name has been largely erased from the history books, is striking. It's an opening that absolutely sticks with you. It has for me, at least. But it's not just there for the sake of spectacle. It's there to instead establish something of the opposite. The fact that we, as a species, are too attracted to spectacle. We aren't horrified by the sight of a bloodied chimpanzee in a birthday hat crouched over the legs of a woman who appears to be dead. The image is instead amusing and intriguing. We're taken by how nonsensical it seems in a way, but we also want more. We want to know what happened. We want the rest of the story. Hell, there's even an argument to be made about us wanting to see the carnage Gordy has inflicted upon his victim, and yet, Peel won't allow it. No matter how far we tilt our heads in the theater, we get the picture. We know what's happened. Sometimes, you don't need the gratuity of an image. We're gonna spend the rest of the time with this image in the back of our minds, wanting to know more, and Peel knows it. The alien, in a fourth wall breaking kind of sense, knows it. It feeds on that. It draws us in. It puts us in a box. That's gonna matter in a bit. The reason this opening is so fucking brilliant is because we don't realize any of that on a first viewing, and yet, Peel's imagery is being all but explicit in saying it. And it is going to matter later on. But with all of this emphasis on imagery, on what sits between the lines, does the text itself suffer in Nope? Well, no. The movie actually does a really great job at establishing who our main characters are, their histories, their motivations, their lives. OJ and Pops are struggling to keep the Hayward Ranch afloat. Their business of leasing horses to Hollywood is on the verge of collapse. This isn't made any easier by Pops' death in a freak accident when a falling coin, a token, in a sense, the very thing he spent his entire life treated as, strikes him in the eye. Pops, who, side note, is played by the legendary Keith freaking David, who utilizes barely a handful of lines in about 90 seconds of screen time to endear you to him, rides a white horse. A pale horse, if you will. A harbinger of death. Hell, the horse's name is Ghost, if the color wasn't enough of a hint. It's an obvious foreshadowing of the man's imminent death, but also of the fact that Ghost will be the first horse abducted by the alien later on. Pops is killed by a token. Ghost is eaten by an alien. The all-seeing, all-consuming eye that represents the swallowing of people of color and their experiences consumed by Hollywood or social media for our entertainment. And yet, they are forced to extreme lengths in order to try and cement their legacies, in order to try and climb the ladder while society places them in an immovable box. Again, you don't know this in the moment on your first viewing, but it's slipped in there unnoticed by Jordan Peele without taking time away from the story he's trying to tell. It's not like there's some big five minute dialogue about why they named the horse Ghost or something. Rather, the movie almost can't wait to kill Keith David because the story Peele is trying to tell depends on that happening. It can be a tricky balance staying on the line between moving your story along without losing the depth of your themes or imagery, or digging deep into the latter but losing the story among the noise. 
and Jordan Peele, as usual, manages to propel both at once with little, if any, faltering. The ramifications of Pops' death come almost immediately. The elder Hayward was respected in Hollywood, or at least people knew that they could get what they wanted out of him, and he could keep his family afloat for the most part with a reliable series of gigs for his horses. OJ doesn't have that same reputation, nor ability, or even warm personality, and so the business and ranch fall into further decline. OJ wants to carve out his own path, and you feel like he has his own ideas and things he wants to do, but he's continuing the family business because of his dad, and that's sort of the path his dad charted out for him. He's put in a box, if you will. He's only allowed to be one thing, the horse guy for the motion picture. Even if his family heritage points to him being from the family of the first movie star, making the business what it is today. Pops is success and when he doesn't come across the same way, doesn't adapt to a white man's expectations for him, it derails, and the filmmakers he was working with move on. Even down to how people on set react to the fact that his name is OJ. They don't say it explicitly, but it's clear their minds jump to OJ Simpson. They view him with a preconceived notion because of the name and the fact that he's a black man. They've put OJ in a box, and he is unfairly being forced to work 10 times harder with a much lower reward because of it. OJ struggling with upholding the family business, the legacy and cultural significance it represents, but is also conflicted because he has his own passions and is losing his grasp on whatever the point was in the Hayward Ranch to begin with. There must be more to life than selling off half your horses to stay afloat and leasing the rest to Hollywood productions. His family shouldn't be in the same situation that his ancestors were. They should have a name, a legacy, they should be respected and further along. They are not just the horse guys. Emerald, meanwhile, wants fame. She wants to be at the top of Hollywood, and she'll do whatever it takes to get there. She'll plug all 20 of her abilities and interests within an important speech to a film crew about what she, OJ, and their horses are going to do because it's the only time she can get in front of these people, so she's got to make it worth their while. And regardless of how unprofessional that is or how annoyed her brother will get with her, it's what she has to do because there's no other opportunity for her to do this. She can't get in a room with these Hollywood executives, with these directors, with these higher-ups, so she's got to make the best use of the time she has. She'll set up equipment to monitor her property, to monitor the alien, but not for protection. To capture the creature on film in order to get the fame and notoriety she so desires. She's actually probably the most fascinating character in the movie. It helps that Kiki Palmer is doing absolutely stunning work. At first, Emerald comes across like the cutthroat stop-at-nothing fame chaser, with an added element of having felt like she never got the chance she deserved early on. And while she is that, she's also deeply passionate about her family, about their safety, and about their legacy. She's determined to stop the alien just as much as she wants to get her money shot of it, and the former arguably supersedes the latter when she finally learns how dangerous the alien really is. There's a big journey that Emerald undergoes from being in a box of her own, chasing the dream, chasing her father and brother into the industry, to breaking out into her own career with her own voice. She's no longer following OJ, she's leading him, to the point where she goes on to not only save his life, but defeat the alien. And Kiki Palmer captures every last nuance of Emerald's shift in character on camera. And I'll say the same for Angel. Maybe the core character of Loner working a dead-end job wants a big adventure isn't new and of itself, but Brandon Pereira, man, guy almost steals the entire movie with a level of charisma beyond what you would expect for a supporting character. Angel reminds me a bit of David Arquette in Scream. Dewey wasn't even supposed to survive the first movie, and instead, he's everyone's favorite. Angel, similarly, seems done for at one point, but he lives to see the end credits. He's even got a nice little bit of backstory about having dated an up-and-coming prospect in the world of modeling and acting, one who, it is clear by the way he shows off her pictures but has nothing to say about her as a person, he was dating her for aesthetic reasons rather than any genuine notions of romance. Angel would have the perfect arm candy for his desire to break out of the monotony of his life, a gorgeous superstar to jet set with. His journey from then to the end of the film allows him to discover that there are more important things, bigger things to chronicle, that an adventure awaits in life, even if you're not bumping shoulders at the Oscars. After he makes it through the trauma of the finality of the film, both in the physical sense but also in having witnessed the things the alien does to people, does he settle back into his job at Fry's? Does he venture to continue capturing the impossible shot at times that matter? Does he relapse into once again chasing the aesthetic of status and fame and the glitz and glamour rather than its reward? It's open to interpretation. We have a great core trio of characters here, the ones coveting the alien, all trying to secure a legacy, all unified in their existence as people of color. 
But there's one character lower down on the list in terms of so-called importance who is nonetheless central to the movie. And no, I'm not talking about Steven Yeun's jupe, but I am talking about someone adjacent to him. So, about Gordy's home. A lot of people think the entire subplot is superfluous to the film, that it pads the runtime just to consequently pad out Jupe as a character, to justify hiring someone as talented as Steven Yun to play him. However, for me, the opposite is true. The entire Gordy saga is vital to Nope. It is the Rosetta Stone for the movie. If it clicks for you, then you'll probably like the film. Jordan Peele has a deep connection to animals in all of his films. Think about the two deer in Get Out, for example, the one Chris hits at the beginning and the taxidermied one he later kills Dean with, or the rabbits in Us. But there's an even stronger, more deeply rooted motif in Nope. You know, animals to me is somehow integral to horror and horrific images to me. Um, I love animals, but they're, they're a real reminder of the existential nightmare of what does it mean to be human? Yeah. And, it, and, and they're a reminder of um, how we treat anything that doesn't qualify as human. And so there's a very real world horror that animals are trapped in. And I think they probably, in, in, in some ways, they symbolize uh, something um, very bad about us. And that's what my movies are about. The animals are a reflection of what that that person's inner psyche is doing, what's happening with them, what position they're in. Peel gives us a glimpse, a pretty vivid one actually, of the attack at the start of the film, but a bit later on, Gordy exists as a memory. First, in Emerald's mind, as a rumor she heard second or third hand about a sitcom that was before her time, but then also as one which haunts Jew. One which he capitalizes on in a small way, such as renting out his private back room that is filled with Gordy's home memorabilia, but more importantly, a shoe from one of the dead cast members of the incident. But at the same time, he's simultaneously trying to repress this, doing it because it's what's getting him ahead, even if he knows deep down it's wrong and feels gross about it. I mean, think about that again. He keeps his mementos of the show in a secret private back room. He's not shy about displaying memorabilia from his career, but it's all from his other work, which Peel wisely captures in full 70mm IMAX, imitating the square ratio that a television set would have displayed Gory's home on, but also making you feel like you're the camera operator capturing the sequence. It's jaw-droppingly horrifying. I mean, seriously, one of the most unsettling sequences of the past several years. But what does it all mean? Well, balloons are the key. The sitcom is shooting a birthday episode. It has a white family and their adopted Asian kid played by Jupe, and the chimpanzee whose lack of personhood is exemplified by how he does not have a name. He's just one of the chimps that played Gordy. Jupe, who has an actual bond with the chimpanzee, deals with his own experiences of being seen as less than human. Even by that age, he was most famous for playing a caricature, an Asian kid sheriff in a time where an Asian holding such a position of power was widely seen as ridiculous by white America. He's fittingly playing a character who gives Gordy a small but sincere present only for his white co-star to bust out a giant box that completely takes his spotlight away. And this bigger present? Just a bunch of balloons. A big box that starts out as some grand promise, only to be a patronizing nothing that literally explodes, bursting against the stage lights and setting the chimpanzee off, only pacified by the sight of jupe by the one person who showed him any true level of kindness or respect. The entire incident is the consequence of putting people in a box, of putting their expectations in a box, of reducing people to tokens and stereotypes. They're just black horse trainers. They've got nothing more to offer cinema, right? We'll just keep them there. We'll compartmentalize them, nothing else. He's just an Asian child actor. Casting him as a token will suffice. Put him in that box. He won't be able to move up the ladder. He's just a monkey. What do monkeys do? They're, there's nothing. Balloons will suffice. That's fine. It doesn't really matter. We'll dress him up, parade him around, and then get rid of him when we're done with him. Balloons demand attention. They attract an audience. And yet, other than their thin shells, they're nothing but air. If they lose their air, or especially if they pop, they take us out of the illusion we were part of something special. That's what happens with Gordy. His illusion of something grand pops with the balloons. The balloons scare Gordy when they pop, but they also remind him of who he is to these people. A source of amusement, an empty spectacle to them, a laughing stock before he is ever a living, feeling being. Gordy attacks the white cast members because he's done trying to prove that he's more than they see him as. They want a mindless chimpanzee? Well, they're gonna get it. And he doesn't attack Jupe because he recognizes the latter is just as much a token as he 
is. Jupe was the only cast member to give him a thoughtful gift, to think of the chimpanzee playing Gordy as something more than a monolith dragged out for amusement. Think about what Jordan Peele said, how we treat anything that doesn't qualify as human. Asians have fallen under that category just as much as any animal has at multiple points in our history and there are still a contingent of people in the United States who clearly feel that way towards Asians. And it's not just Asians, but it's really any person of color. You only need to look at the average comment section on any site really to see that. And that's ultimately why the alien goes on to consume Jupe and his audience as an adult. It seeks out that which has been beaten down, tantalizes with the promise of importance only to consume those who seek it out. OJ, Jupe, Angel, Emerald are all people of color who are all in positions where they're seeking their glory, where they're seeking their time in the spotlight, where they're seeking an opportunity to cement their legacy. OJ wants his family's ranch to become profitable again. Jupe wants to get the fame he had as a child. Angel wants to be part of something real, something more exciting than installing security boxes for a big box store. Emerald wants to be a sensation in the world of acting and filmmaking, but she can't get the opportunity. They all see their opportunity come in the form of the alien. They don't realize, for Jupe especially, who realizes far too late, that the alien is just another balloon, another hollow shell with nothing but air inside. By revealing its inner form down to its maw that looks like an aperture for a camera, by brutally consuming those who pursue it, the alien becomes another Gordy. You seek it out for spectacle? You want to capitalize off of it and treat it as a commodity rather than a living being? A force of nature? You put it in a box? then that's what it will give you. The alien takes it a step further by capturing those it consumes with its lens before literally consuming them. Gordy turned his spectators into a spectacle too, even if it cost him his life. The verse from Nahum that opens the film, from the Hebrew Bible, is apropos here. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. The crew and even the cast of Gordy's home paraded out the chimpanzees, used them as a vessel to generate laughter without regard for, or even in spite of, the creature's feelings or embarrassment, and, well, I think it's fair to say he cast abominable filth on the lead actress of the show, permanently disfiguring her face, perhaps even making her vile as a result. And rather than Gordy's home just being some pastiche sitcom that is fondly remembered by its cult of fans, rather than the chimpanzee being the spectacle, the biggest spectacle on display is that of the violent incident he perpetuated on set, provoked by his being used as a prop. People are always looking to put things in the box they compartmentalize them in, and when that thing, that entity, whether it be a person or a chimpanzee, gives them exactly what they see them as, their prejudices and stereotypes are upheld even if they were provoked into doing just that. The movie works so much better with the Gordy's home storyline intact because with it, the entire film has so much more to say. Without it, I'm not sure Peel's commentary would stand out at all and we'd be left with little more than Jaws except they're hunting an alien rather than a shark. That being said, if a movie is going to send up Spielberg's best film, you're not gonna do it much better than Nope. I love, absolutely love the way Jordan Peele utilizes the sky in Nope in its full frame IMAX glory for the same reason I love how Spielberg shoots the ocean in Jaws. The respective shots achieve the same effect, tension. Peele is always teasing you that the alien may or may not be where you're looking. Is it behind that cloud? Was it that shadow? And then, suddenly, while you're looking for either, boom, there they are, right in your face. It's like a jump scare with much more elegance, grace, fluidity. It puts you in the mindset of these characters. You want to capture this almost unseen force of nature as much as they do, and because of how breathtakingly Peel uses the IMAX ratio, when you do finally see the alien, yeah, it's a lot to take in. It's, uh, it is breathtaking. It's incredible. It's also pretty great how Peel ties the nature of animals into the alien. You might watch the first half of this film in the first time and think, God, when is all this stuff about horses going to actually amount to anything? But your patience is rewarded. OJ is central to tying together these two halves of the story, the horses and the alien, just as the Gordy subplot is vital to gluing all of Peel's commentary together. He knows not to look a horse in the eye, certainly not to show it its own reflection, and he realizes that the alien is provoked the same way. Don't look it in the eye, don't look up, 
let it pass over you, say nope and stay inside and you'll, you'll be good. You'll be good. I think what I love most about that is it turns a traditional black stereotype, a trope in horror films like this, and portrays it as a good thing, as an advantage, as something that's going to save the lives of the main characters. And that's just the genius of Jordan Peele. Turning something that's traditionally a joke at the expense of a certain group of people into something that literally saves their lives is a brilliant subversion that speaks volumes. Our heroes here use their common sense, their intellect and ingenuity. They know where the alien is in the wider sky, but they don't necessarily look it directly in the eye. They don't provoke it. Kind of like how so much of our society will drown out the problems highlighted by the Gordy subplot with their smartphones, with media, with mindless deluges of content, sensationalizing and exploiting something horrifying, something that demands our activism, not our amusement for five minutes of fame as seen through the TMZ reporter. The infamous societal leeches that prey upon these sort of things. They don't care that they're standing on the shoulders of people of color who work their asses off, experienced unthinkable horrors and trauma in order to maybe have a chance at cementing their legacy, they just see it as the next balloon, exemplified beautifully through their use of digital cameras that can be erased, deleted, and disrupted. A similar thing also happens with Wincott. Wincott's chase to the literal death for the impossible is a really impactful moment too, especially in how it changes Emerald's perspective, directing her away from following a similar path and ensuring her survival. Wincott was there. Again. Like Quint wanting to get revenge against sharks, he wanted to be the one that got the better shot, the perfect shot, the impossible shot. Earlier in the film, he warns Emerald about the dangers of trying to climb the fame mountain of perfection, and how you never really reach the top because you're insatiable and perfection is unattainable, it's unknowable. There will always be a higher bar, another white whale to go after. He's aware of his own flaw and his perfectionism, but like an addict to some extent, he can't control his impulses. Him saying, you don't deserve the impossible, is essentially him being like, I've worked my ass off for years in this industry to get a shot like that, and if anyone deserves the perfect version of that shot, it's me. I don't even think he cares if it kills him. He just wants to be the one who gets the shot. He wants the credit. He's not some virtuous guy. He's not necessarily in this to help OJ and Emerald, or even to stop the alien. He was clearly using them to get something he's been after his whole career. He was content with the footage they had captured until he saw an opportunity for something better. He can't possibly be satisfied after that. If he sees an opportunity for something better, then what he has isn't the perfect shot anymore, and he'll stand on the shoulders of people of color in order to get it. They don't deserve the impossible, even if their family helped build the entertainment industry. He doesn't care about the Hayward legacy, he cares about himself. Speaking of the perfect shot, how about that send-up of the Akira bike slide? Probably for all the times that shot has been homaged, the first instance in live action that a filmmaker has actually gotten that shot. How about the Smile, you son of a bitch. moment when Emerald sends that balloon of jupe up to destroy the beast while simultaneously using the old timey crank camera in the well to capture the image of the beast. And when OJ arrives galloping like the horse in motion, Peel is even reclaiming the traditionally whitewashed Western genre, making it more equitable. It's reclaiming a legacy that's always been there, but was never given the respect it deserves. It's a victory against the alien. It's getting the money shot while also achieving something bigger, and it's a victory for film over digital as it's this cumbersome, stuck-in-the-ground machine that develops giant Polaroids that wins the day. It's Jordan Peele giving us one final affirmation, even stubbornly so, not just to the longevity of film as a medium, but to its almost limitless power. Anyone can capture something on a phone, or whatever, but it's mundane. We see it every day, and it can easily be warped, distorted, photoshopped. There's no substitute for the real thing. In a way, Peel set out to capture the impossible, in many senses of the word, just by telling a story about capturing the impossible. And through Emerald's victory, he affirms that spectating, being an audience to something, can evoke and affirm our humanity, not just deny it. That photograph will not only secure her and her family's legacy, but it can hopefully be used to change the hearts and minds of people. It can be used as a stepping stone on the path of moving forward. It can be used as a step in the right direction. Peel affirms that something captured on film can have that power, that capacity. It's a chance, not a guarantee. Maybe it's even an optimistic improbability, but it nonetheless exists. 
He even affirms the new wave of black cinema that he himself is a part of, one that will carve its own path and not be beholden to anything that came before. It will not be put in a box. I don't know about you, but to me, that's one hell of a way to end this extraordinary film we call Nope. Okay, fine, you got me. In one word, what do I think of Nope? Well, yup!